The last few weeks, we've been talking about discipline. We've been talking about discipline. We've been talking about disciplining our children. And uh, today, I want to talk about the next step in that. And so I'm just going to do a, a super, super quick review. In Hebrews chapter 12, verse 5 and 6, Hebrews 12, 5 and 6, and it says, Have you forgotten the exhortation which speaks to you as sons? Okay. My son, don't despise the chastening of the Lord, nor be discouraged when you're rebuked by him. Okay, For whom the Lord loves, he chastens and he scourges every son in whom he receives. And so, you know, we can read scriptures in Proverbs that talk about, um, you know, the fact that if you spoil the rod, you spare the, if you spare the rod, you spoil the child. And I want to say this just to clarify for people. When I speak of the rod, when we talk about the rod, we're talking about stern discipline. I'm not promoting or encouraging you to spank your kids. That's a choice you make as a couple and how you choose to discipline. But, but at the end of the day, you have to have stern discipline. Amen? In fact, spanking, I don't even think, is really the most, uh, it's not the best way to discipline your children. Okay? It really, I don't feel it's the most productive way. But you need to bring stern discipline. You need to put the, the law down in your home, and you have to be the boss. Amen? But you need to also love your kids. And so we're going to talk about that today here. Um, I think these words are very important because they're put in a certain order, and I think the order is important. For whom the Lord chastens, that word chasten comes from the Greek word, which means to bring instruction. So the first way God speaks to us is he gives us instruction from our word, from his word. He gives us instruction in how we should live our lives. All right? The second way he speaks to us, if we, if we, we fail at listening to the word and changing our lives, when we fail at self-discipline, then the Lord will rebuke us. That's the second word, which means what it says to, to rebuke, to confront verbally. And the amazing thing is God is not physically here, so he has to use his body. Say, we are the body, all right? So sometimes, sometimes God will send another believer to come and rebuke you and say something you don't want to hear. But what you need to do is search your heart and say, okay, is, is God, has God already spoken to me about this? Maybe the Lord's given me a second chance. And then the third stage is if you ignore the rebuke, um, we move into this place of scourging, which means there's sincere discipline, okay? And so I'm not going to get too much into that because we spoke about that for three weeks. But now we finished off in Colossians chapter 3, verse 21. It says, fathers, do not provoke your children lest they become discouraged. And uh, if you... Do not take the time to give proper instruction to your children, okay? And so if you're sitting here and you say, I don't have children, well, realize you can have spiritual children, amen? You can have grandchildren. There's other people's children, so you can always relate to children. But it says, fathers, do not provoke your children lest they become discouraged. We provoke our children when we fail to give them instruction first. You hear what I'm saying? Uh, because to provoke, the word provoke means to incite or to to draw up feelings of anger or discouragement in people. That's what it means to provoke. All right? Um, I had a, a boss once. Maybe none of you can relate to this. But uh, he was always traveling. He would come in and he says, Okay, Travis, can you do this? And he'd give me a job assignment. And I'd be, yeah, yeah, but, but. And he'd be, no, no, just get it done. And he'd leave for two days. And I'd be sitting there working by myself going, I think he wants this. I think he expects this. So I'm going to build the machine this way. I was a machinist. And I would, I would build it the way I felt he wanted me to build it. But he never gave me clear instruction. So then he would come back. And he'd be like, what is this? I expected you to do this. And I'd be like, yeah, but you didn't tell me exactly what you expected. And, I, I, and he would storm off angry. And I would be discouraged. Now, if he had given me an outline to say, I want this, this, and this, and this, and I want it this color, and I want these bearings, and I want this system, these pneumatics, and he gave me a proper outline, then uh, if I did it wrong, I'd say, y you're right, I did it wrong, and, and I could handle that. But it's when I didn't have proper instruction that I got discouraged in my soul. How many can relate to what I'm talking about? How many have had a boss like that in the past, right? All right, a couple of you have. Um, so, so the worst thing you can do in disciplining y your children is to not bring instruction first. Say instruction first, then you can bring correction, okay? So those things are very, very important. Um, so we, we need to build our children up. I want to talk about how we do that. How do you build your children up? You need to recognize your role. And our role, we need to realize that our children, they're our children. God has entrusted us with these children. But these children are, 
uh, we are to, we're to be their coach, all right? Say, I'm to be a coach, all right? And, and if you look at what a coach does, a coach is an encourager. Uh, a, a, a coach is a motivator. A coach will help you to strategically, you know, to give you strategic plays and how you can be a better player. How many know what I'm talking about? If you've ever been in sports, you know a good coach will help identify strengths and also help uh, to identify giftings and then to improve them in your life. And that's, that's what a, a coach does. And so if there's a kid who's, who's discouraged and saying, you know, coach, I don't feel like I, I, I'm part of the game because we're playing hockey and I, I, I'm, I'm the defense guy. I can never, I want to go forward and I want to score. And a good coach will say, hey, listen, son, you know what? You, 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 you've got a gift. Your gift is stopping people, you know? And, and you're able to, when the puck is coming, you're able to stop people and get that puck back over. It's, that's, that's your gifting. That's your calling. And you need to do the best you can do. With that. Then, then, that, then that defense guy feels like, yeah, I'm pretty important. I have a role to play. Right? And, and, and then he has confidence. And that's what we do as coaches. When we're coaching our children, whether natural children or spiritual children, we want to motivate them in their gift. We want to encourage them in their gift. Does that make sense? And then you got the guy who's playing forward who's saying, oh, please, please coach, don't put me in defense because I, I, I just, I, I can't stop anything. I just get it and I run and I, or I skate and I go and I score and that's what I do. And so, so a coach will find the strength of each player and put them in their place. That's what a coach does, okay? What does it look like to coach our children? Well, every one of us has a race. We finished on this verse last week and it's Hebrews chapter 12. Verse 1, therefore, we also, since we're surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. And so what we're trying to do with our children, whether natural or spiritual, we're working with development, is we're getting them to focus on the fact that they're in a race, and they have to run that race to win. And, and, and that's when discipline is okay because then you come along and say, hey, listen, I believe in you. God has a plan for your life. God has a destiny for you. You know, before you were formed in the womb, the Bible says God knew you. He had a plan for you. He's appointed you for something. And you have a race to win. And I want to help you win that race. you got to go from here and you got to go over here. And so now you've got to, you know, if you're coaching – he said, listen, you can't eat those Twinkies every night and those chocolate bars and, and, and expect to run the 100-meter dash, okay? You, you can't do that. You have to, you have to take care. You gotta, all that weight has to come off. So suddenly, discipline has a purpose. It's to help you to succeed. It's to help you to, to reach the mark that God has for you, all right? And so, we're, so, so it says here that we're um, easily ensnared by sin, we have weight that holds us back, and as coaches, we want to help discipline our children to lay aside the weight and deal with the sin issues. Why? Not to provoke them, but to see them win the race that God has called them to win. Does that make sense to anybody today? And you, we need to teach our children, we need to teach ourselves that we can't look to our own strength. You say, listen, I want to be a doctor, I want to be a lawyer, I want to be a preacher. Whatever you want to do in life, whatever's your passion, God has put that in your heart. And you want to achieve it, you can't look to your own strength. Right? God can use your strength and ability, but you can't look unto it. The, uh, Hebrews chapter 12 verse 1 says, look unto Jesus, who is the author and finisher of our faith. So when we look unto Jesus, guess what? We're looking unto the one who has authored our faith, and he's going to finish our faith, and it's by faith. The just shall live by faith, and then we have the confidence in Christ to fulfill our race. And so God wants us to realize that we need to look unto him, and we need to teach our children to look unto him as well, right? Who is Jesus? John chapter 1, verse 1 to 3 says, In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. I'm actually reading it out of the King James because the only translation that actually gets that passage correct. The same was in the beginning with God. Okay? All things, say all things, were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. And, and, and when we stop and think about that, 
Jesus was involved in creation. Jesus was involved. He, everything was created by him, and everything was created for him. Isn't that awesome? Everything that we see was made by Jesus. The Bible says in Genesis, in the beginning, God spoke and said, you know, let there be light. The word was spoken forth, and Jesus is the word, and he went forth and created. And we see the working of the Trinity there working together. And so here, here's the thing. God builds with his words. All right? The kingdom of this earth are built with brick and mortar. The spiritual kingdom of heaven is built with words. The, the, the kingdom of darkness is also built with words. That is the building blocks of the kingdom. And so that's why our words are so very important. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 3 says, through faith, say through faith, we understand that the worlds were framed, how? By the word of God, so that the things which are seen were not made of the things which do appear. We, can't, we cannot see the words. They, they're invisible. The kingdom of God is not built with brick and mortar. It's built with words. And here's the key. Words come together to form thoughts, ideas, ideologies, worldviews, okay? You take a bunch of words, you put them together, and they, 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 they form an ideology. They form a worldview. And so God uses words, I know this is simple, but you got to get it, to build his kingdom, all right? So we need to understand this because, because God has chosen what the foolishness, the Bible says, of preaching, right? If you think about what's happening is somebody standing up there, they're putting a bunch of words together to form an ideology, to form a worldview. They're speaking it over a congregation. People grab those words. They grab the idea that was formed with words. They put it in their heart. They believe it. And then to enter into that kingdom, they have to use words. With the heart, one believes. With the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. So you have to hear the words of the kingdom to enter into the kingdom. Then you need to confess the word in order to be saved. And then the Bible says the just shall live by faith, right? And, and it also says in, in, in many places, but in Joshua chapter 1, verse 8, that you're to not let the word of God depart from your mouth. For in doing, if you do not allow the word to come out, depart from your mouth, you will have good success. Amen? And you will be prosperous. And so words have power. Say, words have power. Words can build. And words can tear down. And I think that as believers, we, we sometimes forget how powerful our words really are. In James chapter 3, I'm just going to read a passage of Scripture here in James, verse 10 to 16. It says here, we got it on the screen. And so blessings and cursing come pouring out of the same mouth. Surely, my brothers and sisters, this is not right, okay? Does a spring of water bubble out both fresh water and bitter water? Does a fig tree produce olives or a grapevine produces figs? No, and you can't draw fresh water from a salty spring. If you are wise and understand God's ways, prove it by living an honorable life doing good works with humility that comes from wisdom. That word wisdom actually means it's the application of some kind of knowledge. It's an application, say application of knowledge. And look what it says here, next verse. But if you are bitterly jealous and there is selfish ambition in your hearts, don't cover up the truth with boasting and lying, verse, next verse. For jealousy and selfishness are not God's kind of wisdom, Okay. Such things are earthly, unspiritual, and, say, demonic. For wherever the, there is, go to the next verse, for wherever there is jealousy and selfish ambition, there you will find disorder and every evil, or evil of every kind. Now, this is important. Why is this important? Um, because every thought comes from an intelligent being. Every thought will come, and some people aren't so intelligent, but it comes from a being, not Mr. Bean, not a B-E-A-N, a being, okay? So every being, in order to get a thought, it has to come from an intelligent being. And so there's three places thoughts can come from. Number one, it can come from you. Say, I'm an intelligent being. Well, say it like you believe it. 
I'm intelligent, I think. No. So, so thoughts will derive from you, from who you are as a person. Thoughts will also come from heaven through the Holy Spirit, who's our counselor and comforter and is supposed to be speaking to us, okay? And thoughts can also come from hell. And this is what James is saying. He's saying your tongue is set on fire by hell. And so sometimes thoughts come to you that are negative and feelings that come to negative, and it's actually the enemy. How does this work? Best way to describe it is this. When you turn your radio on, right, and, and you, you have to adjust the knob and the old radios, right, to, to, to find the right radio frequency. How many know you cannot see the words coming through the air, but there's a frequency releasing the words, and then all of a sudden you get the thing just tuned right, and you hear a song, you hear a message, you hear words assembled together to create an idea. And that's how it is in the spirit realm. Thoughts come, and we think, hey, that's my own thought. I'm stupid. I'll never amount to anything. And then, what is it? It's, a, it's a, a frequency. It's a radio wave from hell that is coming into your heart. And you can either believe it or you can reject it. And that's why it's so important to know God's word so you can discern the frequency. And I know Christians, including myself, who have struggled with discerning the frequency. Is this of God? Is this not of God? And, and the problem is, is we're not in the Word enough. Amen? Because as we get in the Word and as we read the Word, it fine-tunes our radio dial so we can hear the frequency of heaven. Isn't that good news? So I'm saying all that to say this. So as believers, we understand the spiritual realms can, can be affected by our Words. We can either build people or destroy people with our words. In Proverbs 18, 21, it says this, death and life, say death and life, are in the power of the tongue. That's the truth. And those who love it will eat its fruit. You can put down a child and say you're no good for nothing. You need to grow up. You need to, and, and you speak like that all the time to your child. Guess what? Your child will become no good for nothing and will not accomplish anything. Why? Because after a while, they begin to believe the words that have been assimilated together to create an ideology. They grab it, and in their heart, they believe it. And with their mouth, they confess it unto their destruction. So the principle of the kingdom, God's kingdom Satan's kingdom is built with the building blocks of words. We need to think before we speak. The Bible says in James that we need to be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to wrath. I don't know about you, but I've struggled with that one. I'm usually quick to speak, quick to get angry, and slow to listen. But we have to work on that. And we need to love our children by listening to them. Amen? Um, Proverbs chapter 15, verse 28 says this. The heart of the godly thinks carefully before speaking. The mouth of the wicked overflows with evil words. The heart of the righteous studies how to answer. You, you don't, because you realize, see, once you get saved, you realize that your words have power to destroy or, or, or to build people up. And I haven't got this figured out, but I'm working on it because... What we can say to someone can tear them down or build them up, okay? But the mouth of the wicked pours forth evil. Are you wicked here? There's no wicked people here. We're saved, right? Born again. So we have to study how we're going to speak. The next verse says, the heart of the godly thinks carefully before speaking. The mouth of the wicked overflows with evil words. Did I just read that? Okay. Proverbs 7, 17, verse 27 to 28. I got all my translations mixed up here, so we'll go. Next one here. Uh, a truly wise person uses few words. Next verse. A person with understanding is even-tempered. And this is amazing, okay? Um, even a fool is counted wise when he holds his peace. When he shuts his lips, he is considered perceptive. All right? But this, this one really got me because, uh, you know, I've done, I've done some counseling in my days. I've been in ministry for 20 years. I don't, you know, think I'm a great counselor, but I do the best I can. And, um, you know, I find I went down, we went down, my wife and I went down to see uh, Bob Bramhill, who does Caring for the Heart. And, and he came here and spoke here. How many remember Bob? And so <coughs> it was amazing because we sat, Camilla talked half the day and I talked half the day, uh, just sh sharing our story. And he would sit there on the other side 
fiddling with his pen. And okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I thought, you know, I, I've come here to spend time with a counselor. He's not talking. I'm doing all the talking. Camilla's doing all the talking. The guy's not talking. He's just listening. He understood this verse, even fools. And then the next verse. Go to the next verse. Yeah. Okay, anyway. He understood that wisdom is to speak less. And he would just listen and listen and listen and listen. And then finally, after hours, after days, he'll say, well, here's your problem. <laughs> and he'll say like a few sentences, and then I'm sitting there going, that's good. How did you get that? <laughs> and I'm like, you nailed the head. Like how? Because he stopped, and he carefully listened. And we're so quick. And, and for me, I've, I've counseled people in the past where they come out, I got this problem, Pastor. Well, the Bible says here in chapter, blah, 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 and you need to do this. Well, what about this, Pastor? Well, the Bible says, blah, 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 blah. And it's like, slow down. Listen. Perceive. And then give careful instruction that's going to bring people to the end of the race without destroying them. Amen? I want to close with this to say, as parents, we need to be motivating our children. We need to be encouraging our children. And you know what happens with our human, the way we are humanly, how, how we think, is we, we tend to look at our life through a microscope. We're looking at all the flaws in our life. And one of the worst things you can do is always focus on the flaws in your kid's life. Well, you got to deal with this. you got to deal with that. You're no good. You're not. And you, you're looking through a microscope. And then the kid starts to look through a microscope, and they lose sight of, of the fact that they have a race to win that they're an athlete called in the kingdom of God to, to, to accomplish great things. And they start looking at all their flaws instead of focusing on their strengths. And it, it, there comes a time where you have to, with your children, whether they're natural or spiritual, you got to take the, the, the microscope away and say, son, daughter, i got a new toy. It's called a telescope. And I want you to take the telescope, and I want you to look down there because God's called you to great things. God has called you to run the race. You have a destiny and a purpose. And so all these little things that you're looking in your life, we need to deal with them. But the reason why we need to deal with them is because you've got a race to win. And suddenly they're motivated to lose the weight. Suddenly they're motivated to deal with their issues. Why? Because they want to accomplish the vision that God has for their life. Amen? And so that's where I want to close today. Why don't we open in prayer? Open, uh, stand up, and then I'm going to pray. Proverbs chapter 12, verse 18, that last scripture, just bring it up. It says, some people make cutting remarks, but the words of the wise bring healing. And Father, my prayer today, Lord, is that you would help us to be a people who would discipline our tongues, the Bible says that no man can control the tongue, but the Holy Ghost in us empowers us so we can control our tongue. So, Lord, I thank you, Father, that you would help us to cut off the cutting remarks and think about the words we're speaking, not only to our children, but to one another, that we would be wise people bringing healing with our words, Father. Hallelujah. Clara, could you just come and play something softly on the piano? That would be great. Hallelujah. We love you, Lord. Thank you, God, for motivating us. Thank you, Lord, for, for encouraging us. Lord, personally, I would have given up on Travis a long time ago. How many of you have ever thought that? You thought, man, I would have given up on me a long time ago. But, God, you're so faithful. Even when we're faithless, you remain faithful. You are a good, good father. Hallelujah. Thank you, God. Thank you that we're your children and we're empowered by the Spirit and by the grace of God to motivate and encourage our children first, to discipline after, but to motivate first. Help us, Lord, to understand what it means to take away the microscope and hand them a telescope. In Jesus' name, hallelujah. Praise the Lord.